say again, I, you, your excellence helps us worship. Thank you. Yeah, because I mean, it's about Jesus, but he gave these gifts. I mean, yeah, wow, okay, I'll stop. Anyway, it's really great to see you all, and I cannot believe it, but it is already the fourth Sunday of Advent, as witnessed by all four Advent candles being lit. Good job, Roxy. You got the third one to go. And so today is peace. It's the peace candle. The topic is peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And if you've seen any news lately, or if you've lived in any house or ridden in a car with another person, peace is often lacking. But Jesus came to give us peace. And that's what the angel said. So my, my title today is, turn on my clicker, there we go, Jesus, peace to those on whom God's favor rests. And if those words seem familiar, it's because that's what the angel said to the shepherds. He, the angel came and he said, well, actually, I'm going to read to you what the angel said. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Now, this is in the field. This is to the shepherds. This is what we talked about last week. The angel came and he appeared, the glory of the Lord. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. This is what the, this is what the, the great company is singing. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to him and peace on earth. But he didn't stop right there. Because the peace is contingent. It's peace on earth to those on whom his favor rests. See, we don't all get the peace. We have to choose the peace. We have to. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those on whom God's favor rests. Now, how do you get God's favor? That's then the question, right? I mean, other translations say, to those, on whom, to those with whom God is pleased. We know that Mary was chosen, but she was chosen because God could favor her. And this is what I mean by could favor, and this is my job to try to explain what I'm talking about, because if you leave and you don't know what I'm talking about, then I certainly didn't do my job very well. Peace is out there if we want it. And the reason Mary was favored is because she was favorable. See, Gary Benedict, who's the president of Crown College when I was there, he always used to say, you have to put yourself in a blessable position. You have to put yourself in a blessable position. God is constantly blessing. You have to put yourself in a blessable position. So I'll explain it like this. There are two farmers, me and this farmer here. He's a much better farmer. And we both, we both pray like, oh God, please bless our farm, give us lots of crops, fill our fields. And I go in my house and play Xbox all day long. But I keep praying. I keep praying for my field to be blessed. And the other farmer, he prays, and then he goes out and he plows. And then after he plows, he discs. And after he discs, he harrows. And after he harrows, he plants. And then he cultivates, and he watches over his field. And I continue to play Xbox. Maybe I even get a PlayStation, you know, because you can't always play Xbox. And we both keep praying. And God sends the sun. And God sends the rain. And God sends the sun. And God sends the rain. And God sends the sun. And God sends the rain. And at harvest time, he has full fields. And my fields are still a mess. 
And then I say, God, why didn't you bless me? Why did you bless him, but you didn't bless me? And the answer would be, because I did not put myself in a blessable position. Because God sent the rain and the sun to both of us. But this wise farmer put himself in a place where he could be blessed. And so Mary, we read about her in Luke chapter 2. No, sorry, Luke chapter 1. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Now, Elizabeth was Mary's relative, an older relative, a much, much older relative, and she's actually pregnant with the man that becomes John the Baptist. So in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. She was highly favored. Now, we're not told why here. The rest of Scripture helps us understand why she was favored. But she was, there was something about her. There was something about this young girl named Mary. And when God looked down, he saw her and he was pleased with her. She was highly favored. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. She was in a place where God could choose and bless her. We don't know why yet, but we get some insight from a story way back in the beginning of the Bible. Noah and the flood. Here's the story of Noah. The Lord saw, this is way back, I mean, if you have a Bible, this is the sixth, we're six chapters into the Bible, barely after creation. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. He just looked and he saw and it was wicked. And you know what humans are because you are one. I mean, even, even the best of us have awful, awful tendencies. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. And if you're familiar with the scriptures, you know that the first human being that was born, there was Adam and then there was Eve and then they had a son named Cain and then they had another son named Abel. And the first son, Cain, got so angry at his brother that he murdered him. The first human being born murdered his brother. That's, that's, that's what humans are. Now, thankfully, we are created in the image of God, and we are not all as bad as we could be. We have a conscience. I mean, I mean God has given us so many things. He gives us, he gives us a, a conscience. He gives us this sense of morality. He gives us societies. He gives us teachers and parents, and he gives us police officers, and all these things hopefully deter us from becoming as bad as we could be. That beautiful thing he puts in us but we fight against it and we push and sometimes we can drown it out and that's what Cain did. And now by this time, God saw and it was just a mess. I mean, look at that last line. Every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. And we don't have to be taught this. I mean, have you ever seen two little kids? They'll be happy playing for a little while, and then one of them will have a toy, and then the other one says, well, wait a minute. I think I want that toy. And all of a sudden, it's like... <laughs> the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth. And think about how sad that is. Because God loves the world. I mean, he loves you. He loves me. He loves the whole world. And yet he looks and it's so bad and it's so sad that he regrets that he ever created them. Others translate, other translations just talk about how his heart is broken. He's mourning 
because his beautiful world has become this horrible evil. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. That's where he is. He's like, it's better if I just call the whole thing off. If I just get rid of them all. In fact, I'll get rid of the animals and the birds and the creatures that move along the ground for I regret that I have made them. That's rough. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. If you grew up with the King James Version, it says, but Noah found grace because this grace and favor, they're connected. This pleasing God. So God sees the earth and his heart is broken and he's so sad and he's grieved and he wishes he had never created them. And then he sees one man, Noah. And as God watches that man, Noah, there's something different. Noah finds favor. And this is what he says. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. That's what Noah did to put himself in a place where he could be blessed and favored and have grace. He walked with God. He was faithful. He was righteous. He was blameless. Now, it doesn't mean that Noah never sinned, but his life was lived in a God-word direction. He was faithful in his walk with God. And that is, I mean, here's the secret. That's how we have peace. That's it. And you all know that a guilty conscience does not allow us to have peace. Because you've all, I mean, there's my beautiful daughter in the back. Yeah, I call you out, Maria. When she was little, I don't know, two, three, she went to a daycare where my wife worked. And she's always a happy, you know, just the happiest little dancing girl, you know, wearing tutus. And, and one day she comes home and she's like, are you okay, Maria? Well, I don't want to talk about it. And I'm like, well, son, you know, something's wrong. I'm no detective, but I figured this out. <laughs> and so I'm asking, and I'm asking, and I'm asking, and I'm asking, and she won't say. And then she tells us that she doesn't want to go back to the daycare tomorrow. And we're like, okay, what's, what's going on? Like, what? She doesn't want to talk about it, but she doesn't want to go back. And finally, she says, well because my teacher's mad at me and she did something wrong. I mean, you know how horrible two-year-olds can be. Some horrible evil was committed, I'm sure. But my little girl, she did not want because she felt this shame and she felt the displeasure of her teacher and it ruined her night. Not just her day, it ruined her night. She had no rest and she had no peace. The next day, the good news is she found out the teacher wasn't mad anymore. She was forgiven and she could go back to being the happy little girl dancing around in a tutu. But a conscience that is guilty or troubled does not allow us to have peace. It just doesn't. I, I have some really good news. I've never, ever, 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 ever once heard the sound of sirens and thought, they're going to catch me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. However, my uncle, I remember being with him one time and he heard sirens and he was terrified because, you know, he was on the lamb. I've never felt that. Now, I've felt a lot of other guilty things and I'm sure you all have also. And when we live a righteous life, when we do the right things, we have peace. Peace on those on whom God's favor rests. Peace on whom. So if you have a family and there's a lot of conflict, you need to say, okay, one or both of us are not putting ourselves in a blessable position. How can we? Because it's ridiculous that peace is offered and we don't take it. I mean, think about that. If I could say to you, you can have peace. And we often think that life circumstances, if, if our life was different, if this was different, and 
I've said this before, but I'll say it again. If I asked every one of you to change one thing, one thing in your life that you can ask to have changed, and it will be changed like that. Maybe, maybe you're sick, and you would say, I just want to be healed. Or maybe you live in constant pain, and you say, I just want my back better. Or maybe you say, I just, I'm running out of money. I wish I had a million dollars. Whatever thing you wished for, it would give you some momentary, temporary happiness. But at some point, if you were healed of some sickness, guess what? 30 or 40 or 50 years later, you're still going to die. Mm -hmm. Earth, happiness, and peace is good. But what we are offered is eternal soul peace. Peace on those on whom God's favor rests. And that's what the Christmas season is about. I mean, that's why we light candles. See, the candles represent that there is light in a dark world. There is hope. There is joy. There is love. There is peace. And we get it by putting ourselves in a blessable position. We get it by living like Noah or living like Mary or living like Jesus. And if you think about Jesus, he had internal peace when all around him was chaos, when they're shouting and screaming and mocking, when they're nailing him to a cross, he still has deep heart peace because he trusted in his father, because he was a righteous man. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Now, as Chuck Hertz read earlier, the Apostle Paul writes about how to have peace. In Philippians chapter 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Here's an interesting part of peace, is that if we rejoice, it helps us have peace. If we praise, see, you are created by design on purpose. And you are created to praise. You're created to rejoice. I'll, so there's my lovely daughter again. When she was a little girl, there was, we lived in Watertown, and there was this wonderful little restaurant called The Hungry Bear, and we would go every once in a while, and I taught her that if she orders root beer and then she takes the coffee half and half and dumps a bunch of it in her root beer, it kind of tastes like a melted root beer float, and we would sit there and we would laugh and we would have fun. I know, it's a good trick. You should try it at home. I learned it from Laverne. <clears throat> Now, I'm going to tell you two stories about the hungry bear and see which version of me is a happier version of me. Oh, the hungry bear, it's terrible. The service, oh, it takes forever. Prices are so high. When the food gets to you, it's cold. Oh, don't ever go there. Or, oh, I love the hungry bear. I used to go there with my little girl and we would sit and we would laugh and I don't even remember what we had, probably like pancakes or something. Now, which person is happier? The one who's complaining or the one who's saying how great things are because we were created to praise you are a happier you when you are praising and i was just praising the hungry bear by the way it's not the hungry bear anymore but i'm sure it's good go eat there imagine if you are just praising your creator because he's always good he's never not worthy of praise i mean this morning i'm driving in down highway seven and i don't like the winter I, I say that so often you guys are probably like yeah blah 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 we get it move or be quiet <laughs> but i'm driving in and i see the white and i see the sun and it's just like coming up and it's big and it's lighting the world and or the trees and I'm like this is amazing this is like you tell me the creator of that isn't worthy of being praised of at least being told hey God I just want to tell you good job it's beautiful and we have all of these things he says rejoice in the Lord always I will say it again rejoice do not be anxious about anything. That's the next thing. Oh, I, I skipped one. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Now, when I think of gentleness, I generally think of, like, not being rough. I mean, like, physically. like. Rah. But then I start thinking about, like, just gentleness of soul. Have you ever been around a person that's just gentle of soul? 
In fact, have you ever been to a funeral and they say things like this? There was not a mean bone in his body because everything was positive. He was kind. He was giving. He was sharing. Let your gentleness rejoice always and let your gentleness be evident to all. When you go into Quick Trip, let your gentleness be evident. When you go to the movies, when you go to the grocery store, when you're being woken up in the middle of the night by your children, <laughs> let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. And that means, I mean, he's near. One, he's got your back. Like You don't have to be fighting your fights. You can let your gentleness be evident to all. But two, he's there. He's watching. He's paying attention to how we live and what we are doing. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. And the fact that he tells us not to do it means we have some control over it. Now, I know that there is anxiety disorders. I understand how, plus people just get whipped up. I mean, I get whipped up. I'm like, oh. And I'm like a calm, anxious person. I kind of look like this when I'm anxious, but I'm still anxious. But he says, do not be anxious about anything. And I, I heard this once, and I thought it was the most ridiculous, corny thing I'd ever heard. There was a Christian counselor famous in the 70s named Wright, Henry Wright, or some, some Wright. And uh, he said, if you struggle with letting your emotions get the best of you, they get whipped up and fast forward. He said, I want you to take a three by five card and write these verses. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And I want you to carry that in your back pocket. And when you feel anxious, I want you to take that out and read it. And I thought, that is so ridiculous and corny. And then he explained psychologically what happens. Your mind wires itself. And the more you do something, the harder that is wired into your brain and you have automatic responses. And when you feel worry or anxiety coming on, by stopping that thought because you're reaching in your pocket and getting a new thought, you rewire your mind. I'm like, how cool is that? Like we can actually change our thinking patterns. We can change our thinking patterns. And so the Apostle Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer. So when you feel the anxiety, when the peace is leaving, stop and pray. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving. So you pray, you petition, and then you give thanks and you're rejoicing already. You're speaking your native language. You are created to praise, and you are thanking, and you are praising, and you are thanking, and you are praising. In our family, we used to play the thankful game. We haven't played it for a long time. We're due for another round. It would be Thanksgiving, and we would pray. I mean, we would play the thankful game, and here's how the thankful game goes. I thank God for, you have to thank God. You just can't be thankful. Who are you thanking? I thank God for, trees and then the next person i thank god for and the next person i thank god for my favorite of all time was when my little boy said i thank god for the sewer system i'm like yes i also am very thankful for the sewer system <laughs> why what what made you think of that judah because that's where the ninja turtles live <laughs> See, you got to be thankful for a home for the turtles, too. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And you know why God wants to hear them? Because he cares about you. And it matters. Because he came to earth to bring peace. He wants peace. He's the prince of peace. And he wants peace for you. And he wants peace for your home. And he wants peace for your neighbors. And he wants peace for Washington, D.C. He wants peace for the Middle East. He's the God of peace. He wants to bless. He wants to favor. But we have to put ourselves in a place where we can be favored and blessed. 
And the peace of God, after we do these things, the Apostle Paul says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, because it doesn't make sense. Because how could Jesus have peace when he's being crucified? How? You've heard the stories of missionaries who've been put in prison or beaten, and they talk about this peace and this joy. You've read the stories of the Apostle Paul when he, after he's been beaten, he's locked in chains in a prison, and he still sings psalms and hymns and pray. How? That doesn't make sense. That goes beyond my understanding. Yes, it's the peace that passes understanding. It transcends, and here's what it will do. It will guard. It will stand guard over your heart and over your mind. The peace that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's how we have peace. Now, it's not our nature because again, my nature is to fight and to claw and to grab and to have. I mean, I learned it, like I told you, little kids do it. That's your, I remember my, he's my brother-in-law now. He wasn't then because we were like five. We loved playing with semis. I always wanted the semi he had. I don't know why, because it was better. He probably wanted the semi I had. Our dads were truck drivers. We loved semis, but his were always better. And I wanted them. I, it's just what we do. It's just, and we love to control. Oh, dear. I mean, I don't know if you've ever met any humans. They love to control. <laughs> Now, they don't do a very good job controlling themselves, but they want to control you. We just, it's what we do. But Jesus came to bring peace, a peace that passes understanding. And we will have peace. There is peace to those on whom God's favor rests if we will take it. If we will take it. And that's the, the craziest part of this whole Christmas story is that we get to decide what happens with it. Because do you realize how many people do not believe it's true? They just do not believe that there is a Savior who was born. And if they do believe there's a Savior that was born, they don't believe he can do anything for them. See, there's a story. Erwin McManus, famous author, preacher, teacher, pastor somewhere in California. He was invited to go to the Middle East and he was invited to lecture in the Middle East. And most of his audience was going to be Islamic. And so he didn't want to rub them the wrong way. He didn't want to offend them. So he wanted to avoid talking about Jesus as much as he could. Because if you're invited as a guest, he wanted to be respectful. He wanted to talk about things in the Old Testament that they would agree on, things were, that they would have in common and build bridges. And so he's lecturing and lecturing. And questions come up, yeah, but what about Jesus? And he kind of says, like, well, you know, and he ignores it and goes on. Questions come up about Jesus. Questions come up. Finally, he says, okay. I will talk to you about Jesus. There once was a girl named Kim. And his translator looks at him like, okay, they were asking you about Jesus, and I don't, I don't know any stories about Kim in the Bible. Just translate. There once was a girl named Kim, and I loved her. So I pursued her. I took her out to eat. I took her to movies. I took her shopping and bought her things. I wrote her love letters. And when I thought Kim loved me also, I asked her to marry me. And Kim said, no. So I took her out more. And I bought her more jewelry. And I wrote her more love letters. And the next time I asked her to marry me, she said yes. And after she said no to me the first time, I didn't send my dad to try to convince her to marry me. I didn't send my brother to try to convince her to marry me. I didn't send one of my friends to try to convince her to marry me. I pursued her myself. Because in matters of the heart, you handle it yourself. And Jesus is God coming to the world to pursue it himself. Jesus loves you. 
He so deeply loves you. And you say no, and he keeps giving. And you say no, and he keeps giving. And you say no, and he keeps giving. Because in matters of the heart, you do it yourself. And his offer is peace to those on whom God's favor rests. May we be wise enough to say yes. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you love us. And I just pray that you continue to work in us and you transform us and you, you help us to live righteous lives. You help us to walk faithfully with you because you know all the things that get in the way and all the things that we are so distracted by. And you know that the one true thing we need is you. And so I pray, I just ask you somehow to, to make us people that you can bless. Thank you so much for being so good to us. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.